tomorrow is Columbus Day. And I say we should celebrate it in the name of Christ. You know, the conversation about Columbus has changed quite a bit in recent years. But we remember parts of the old poem about him first. It goes like this. In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. He had three ships and left from Spain. He sailed through sunshine, wind, and rain. He sailed by night, he sailed by day. He used the stars to find his way. A compass also helped him know how to find the way to go. Ninety sailors were on board. Some men worked while others snored. Then the workers went to sleep, and others watched the ocean deep. Day after day they looked for land, they dreamed of trees and rocks and sand. October 12th, their dream came true. You never saw a happier crew. <laughs> Remember that? Yeah. Yeah, I do. Well, they were happy because it had been a long, harrowing voyage. They had been sailing across the Atlantic Ocean for ten weeks with no assurance that they would arrive anywhere. Columbus had convinced them, as well as others in Spain and Italy, that he could navigate a new route and passage to the Indies. And he did indeed understand <coughs> that the earth was round, not flat. So he was confident that God would help him find a new way to trade and evangelize to distant lands. Christopher Columbus was clearly not the first European to visit continents that soon became known as the New World. Vikings had traveled to America centuries earlier, and there is some evidence that Romans, and possibly even the Hebrews, had been here long before then. <coughs> but Columbus first widely publicized and thus discovered its existence to the Europeans, who were mostly unaware that it was even here. And there were, of course, other people living in this land at the time, whom the adventuring Europeans eventually evangelized and subdued and exploited so we hear today other opinions and criticisms of the significance of the Columbus explorations. But you know, when studying recorded history of Western civilization, one cannot not notice the landing of Christopher Columbus in 1492. Anyone writing or reading world history has to regard the event among the four or five most noticeable and notable in recorded history, whether one considers the exploits to be honorable or not. And those of us who pay special attention to the branch of world history that deals with the story of Christianity see Columbus as a monumental figure. By bringing in Christ, his church, and the culture called Christianity <coughs> to a land of people who had not yet heard of our Savior, he did indeed bring and begin to change the face and the future of the world in which we live. And whether one sees Christopher Columbus as a victor for Christ or a villain of European imperial <coughs> expansion and exploitation, his enterprise cannot be presented without reference to his faith. And despite differing opinions on his motivations, it is undisputable that Columbus undertook his first voyage facing the prospect of great danger, and that he displayed great faith and great courage. You see, the professional opinion of that day not only <coughs> assured him that his proposed voyage and endeavor was impossible, but it also warned him that dragons and death awaited him beyond the charted waters. And with such advice coming from the intellectual leaders of his day, 
His decision to embark on this unprecedented journey must have been difficult. <clears throat> so, why did he set out? Well, Columbus himself answered that question in his own writings, saying, at this time I have seen and put in study to look into all the scriptures, cosmography, histories, chronicles, and philosophy, and other arts, which our Lord opened to my understanding. I could sense his hand upon me, so that it became clear to me that it was feasible to navigate from here to the Indies. And he unlocked within me the determination to execute the idea. And I came to your highnesses with this ardor. All those who heard about my enterprise rejected it with laughter, scoffing at me. Neither the sciences, which I mentioned above, nor the authoritative citations from them were of any avail. In only your highnesses remain faith and constancy. Who doubts that this illumination was from the Holy Spirit? I attest that he, with marvelous rays of light, consoled me through the holy and sacred scriptures, encouraging me to proceed, and continually, without ceasing for a moment, they inflame me with a sense of great urgency." Unquote. Those who disapprove or disparage the history and heritage of our country and our culture question, was it the expansion of Christianity into our hemisphere that brought to the people of this land the gift of Christian faith with its power of humanity and salvation, dignity and fraternity, justice and love? Or was it the beginning of invasion, genocide, slavery, ecocide, and exploitation? It is especially because of Columbus's Christian convictions and motivations that he has become a villain today for most modern educators and writers who regularly now attack and condemn him. And they have adopted the deplorable practice of what's called deconstructionism, of attacking traditional Western heroes values, and institutions, while attempting to deny and defeat any aspect of the idea that the United States has been a Christian nation. And interestingly, in the 1892 Supreme Court decision, Church of the Holy Trinity versus the U.S., the court unanimously affirmed that America was indeed a Christian nation. And in so doing, it cited dozens of precedents from American history, including that of Christopher Columbus. The Supreme Court said, From the discovery of this continent to the present hour, there is a single voice making this affirmation that America is a Christian nation. Among other evidences, the commission to Christopher Columbus recited, it is hoped that by God's assistance, some of the continents and islands in the ocean will be discovered. <coughs> the Supreme Court. But who was this man, Christopher Columbus? He was a child of the Renaissance, born into an Italian family of Christ-converted Jews. Cristoforo Colombo, his Italian name, was the eldest son of Domenico Colombo, a wool worker and merchant, and his wife, Susanna Fontana Rosa. Christopher's career began as a seaman in the Portuguese merchant marine, and after surviving a shipwreck off Cape St. Vincent at the southwestern point of Portugal in 1476, he based himself in Lisbon, together with his brother Bartholomew, and both were employed there as chart makers. But Columbus was principally a seagoing entrepreneur, and in 1477 he sailed to Iceland and Ireland, 
with the Merchant Marine. And in 1478, he was buying and selling sugar for a firm from his home city of Genoa. In 1479, he met and married Filippa Perestrello a Moniz, <laughs> who was a member of a poor but noble Portuguese family. She died five years later, but his relationship with her family helped him to establish influential relations in the trading industry. And a great number of interests were involved in this, his adventure, which was in essence an attempt to find a route to the rich land of China and to India and to the fabled gold and spice islands of the east by sailing westward over what was presumed to be open sea. Columbus himself clearly hoped through this to rise from his humble beginnings and to accumulate some riches for his family and to join the ranks of the nobility of Spain. The Catholic monarchs of Spain, of Italy, and the church hoped that such an enterprise would gain them greater status among the other monarchies of Europe especially against their main rival of Portugal. And then, in alliance with Pope Alexander VII, they might hope to take the lead in the Christian war against the Muslims, who had been attempting to conquer the Western world, and in fact who had just recently been driven out of Spain. Also, the influential Franciscan brethren were preparing for the eventual end of the world, and they let everybody know it, because they saw the prophecies in the Revelation to John. And according to their vision, Christendom would recapture Jerusalem from Islam and install a Christian emperor in the Holy Land in preparation for the coming and defeat of Antichrist. The Christian conversion of the whole human race was part of that, as was the final judgment. And Franciscans and others hoped that Columbus's westward project would help to finance a crusade to the Holy Land that might even be reinforced or coordinated with offensives from the Emperor of China who was thought to be interested in Christianity too. Columbus carried a letter of friendship addressed to the Emperor of China from the Spanish monarchs. Now Columbus was not a saint, but certainly he was a defender of the faith. He was a Christian and a Catholic, and his faith was strong, sincere, inexhaustible, free from superstition and hypocrisy, at least initially. He made frequent references to God in nearly all of his writings. So what inspired Christopher Columbus? Was he searching just for personal recognition or some financial reward? Well, the answer to that question is no, not really. Columbus was inspired by a very deep spiritual goal. And one clue to this is his very name. Christopher means Christ bearer. And Columbus believed that he was divinely given this name and destined to carry the gospel of Jesus across the ocean. His other main motive, as I mentioned, was to help enable a crusade to recover the Holy Land. And his continuous and obsessive search for gold and riches was primarily purposed to reunite the Christian world that had been split by the Muslims with the fall of Constantinople. He wanted to bring the world back to unity as part of his other main motivation. As many educated men of his time, Columbus <coughs> knew the world was round. In fact, he often made notes in the margins of his books that one could reach the Far East by sailing west across the ocean. His voyages were not really about discovery as much as they were intense religious missions. 
He, he saw them as a divine plan for his life, as well as for a world that would soon be coming to an end. He put it this way in 1500. He said, God made me the messenger of the new heaven and the new earth, of which he spoke in the Apocalypse of St. John. And after having spoken of it through the mouth of Isaiah, he showed me the spot where to find it. So he really thought he was on a mission like that. I mentioned the fact that Columbus knew the earth was round, as did most people of his time. The flat earth idea is part of a myth that has been infused into the story to help discredit Christians of that time and ours. See, skeptics, atheists, and Bible critics love to accuse biblical creationists, biblical believers, of believing also in a flat earth. And since we take Genesis literally, we must also believe in a flat earth, they say. And this is, of course, not true. <laughs> the Bible consistently points to a spherical earth. It talks about that. One of the oldest books in the Bible is the book of Job, which gives a few clear indications that the earth is round. For one, Job declares, God has inscribed a circle on the face of the waters at the boundary between light and darkness. And that same expression is also used in Proverbs 8, which also refers to God having inscribed a circle on the face of the waters. Isaiah chapter 40 reveals that God sits above the circle of the earth. So Christians believe that the earth was round. Jesus said that he would return when people were in bed, working in a field, and grinding at a mill. He's referring to one moment in time, but it's enduring different times of the day for various people suggesting different times and around earth. Christ knew all about the spherical nature of the earth, of course, because he is the one who created it. Now, I remember being taught in school that people used to believe the earth was flat. They told me that the ancients believed that there were people on the other side of the earth, known as antipodes, and they thought that these people walked upside down. I read that and I remembered hearing that. It was, I used to think about it. It was a funny picture. Uh, Christopher Columbus, they said, had a difficult time finding a crew because everyone was afraid that he would sail and fall off the edge of the earth because it was just flat like that. And that's what I was taught in our public government school system. And this story is still being taught today, even in Christian schools. Because nowadays, this story is accepted as historical, but it's just simply not true. See, as early as the 3rd century B.C., men knew that the earth was round. We read some other references from the Bible, but it was also based on scientific observations made by a man called Eratosthenes. He, in Egypt, observed the length of shadow cast in Alexandria, and also that no shadow was cast uh, in another part of the country, in Aswan, on the summer solstice. And so he was able to measure and figure that the earth must be round, and he came to within 1% uh, of actually figuring the size of the earth. Plato Aristotle, other Greek intellectuals, also taught that the earth was round as well. But did the church ignore this information and teach a flat earth? Absolutely not. A few figures throughout Christian history made statements that some have interpreted as teaching a flat earth, but most have been misinterpreted, and the church did not teach a flat earth during the time of Columbus. These explorers did not believe they were going to fall off the edge of the earth. Columbus had difficulty obtaining a crew because he was Italian, 
trying to convince Spaniards to sail with him, and because people doubted whether or not one could bring enough supplies and food on the ships for such a long journey. The European people of the time knew that a person could reach the east by sailing west, but they also knew it was a tremendously long distance, and they did not know about the American continents there. And so they thought that Columbus would need to sail all the way from Spain to China nonstop. Columbus convinced the authorities that the distance would not be as far as they thought by using different figures than what they had used and had been established for centuries. But you know, ironically, those authorities were right about the distance and Columbus pretty much lucked out <laughs> because he did have enough supplies to reach the Bahamas, which is where they landed. And the flat earth misinformation uh, that we talked about mostly began uh, in 1828 with Washington Irving's fictional biography of Christopher Columbus that talked about that. This book promoted the lie that the ignorant medieval Christian folks thought that the earth was flat, and Columbus had to convince them otherwise. And most historians now recognize that the church did not teach a flat earth. Yet, as I said, the lie is still taught in numerous books and schools, much like the disproven evidences for evolutionism. And this was interesting. Even the late Stephen Jay Gould, who was a leading evolutionist, came to the Christian's defense when he said, for the myth itself only makes sense under a prejudicial view of Western history as an era of darkness between lighted beacons of classical learning and Renaissance revival, while the 19th century invention of the flat earth, as we shall see, occurred to support another dubious and harmful separation wedded to another legend of historical progress, the supposed warfare between science and religion. He was honest about that. So the church did not teach a flat earth. The Bible does not teach a flat earth. Apparently people like Irving and John W. Draper, another guy, invented the flat earth myth in an effort to attack Biblical Christianity back then. And once again, it has been shown that the Bible is not at odds with modern science. Rather, modern science confirms Biblical teaching. In my message a few weeks ago about the blood moons, I, I mentioned that the tetrad of four lunar eclipses on high holy days of the Bible in 1492 coincided with the Spanish Inquisition and the Jewish expulsion from Spain, and that Columbus was also involved with helping the Jews. Well, the day after that expulsion of the Jews, August 3rd, 1492, Christopher Columbus left on his famed voyage of discovery, and his diary begins, in the same month in which their majesties issued the edict that all Jews should be driven out of the kingdom and its territories, they gave me the order to undertake with sufficient men my expedition of discovery of the Indies. And a very good case can be made that Columbus was of Jewish ancestry. And there's much evidence for that, but I'll not address that now for sake of time. But there's no question that Columbus's voyage to America was also spiritually linked to the Jewish expulsion and the Jewish people in their plight. And just as one of the greatest Jewish communities of medieval Europe is being destroyed, God was opening up the doors of what would eventually become their greatest refuge for Jews in history, America. This is another tremendous pattern that we see in history. God creating the cure before the disease. 
Incidentally, Columbus's voyage was not financed by Isabella selling her jewels, as is often, often stated. <laughs> the, the major financiers were two court officials, both Jewish converts. Uh, Louis de Saint-Angel, chancellor of the royal household, and Gabriel Sanchez, treasurer of Aragon. And the first letter Columbus sent back from the New World was not to Ferdinand and Isabella, but to Sant'Angel and Sanchez, thanking them for their support and telling them what he found. And now there are basically two competing narratives about Christopher Columbus. As we observe another Columbus Day, along with the annual arguments over him, I'd like to suggest a third way of looking at the man. When I was a kid, Columbus was a hero. He was a brave explorer who discovered America while looking for a shorter trade route to India. His discovery led to people from European countries braving terrible danger to come to the New World and start the colonies that would eventually form the United States and give us the country we have today. Well, today, many people view him in an entirely different way. Columbus was a greedy, murdering villain who was responsible for the destruction of the peaceful Native American societies that existed before he showed up. The natives were universally peace-loving and kind people who had their way of life destroyed by Columbus. If it hadn't been for Columbus, the natives would have continued living in peace and harmony while the Europeans fought among themselves elsewhere. Well, neither view is especially honest or nuanced. And again, I'd just like to briefly suggest another way of remembering Christopher Columbus. First of all, Columbus's towering stature as a seaman and navigator, the sheer power of his religious convictions, misguided as they sometimes were, his personal magnetism, his courage, his endurance, his determination, and above all his achievements as an explorer should continue to be recognized. There's no doubt about that. However, he was wrong about many things. And yes, disaster through disease and colonization befell many people who were already living in this land, for which Columbus was partly responsible, and he admitted as much later by referring to himself as the worst of sinners. But he brought benefits to many as well. Not all people on this continent were gentle, peace-loving, and living in harmony with nature. Some practiced cannibalism. Others engaged in human sacrifice. Many exploited natural resources and other people as they migrated from place to place. The natives were sinners too. Columbus bore Christ. He helped to spread the good news of the gospel and the mercy of God even through the wake of wickedness that all people disperse. Harvard historian Samuel Eliot Morrison, in his Pulitzer Prize-winning book, Admiral of the Ocean Sea, was more generous in his appraisal of Columbus, even after fairly considering most aspects of his exploits. Morrison wrote, Through it all, I cannot forget the eternal faith that sent this man forth to the benefit of all future ages. Christopher Columbus may not have been the noble hero of my childhood belief, but he also was not a murderous villain who inflicted genocide upon innocent people, which is being taught to school children today. Columbus sought the Christian conversion of the natives that he encountered. On the premise and belief that all people are lost without Christ, 
such a modern, such a concern could be interpreted as an expression of genuine love rather than of hate. And I say, celebrate Columbus Day in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.